Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. All right, 1 Samuel chapter 13, a very famous passage here where we see the kingdom being rent from Saul and God beginning to do things to set it up for David. I want you to look at verse number 19. 1 Samuel 13, verse 19, the Bible reads, Now there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, Lest the Hebrews make them swords or spears. Look, they were surrounded by the enemy, and the enemy wanted them to not be able to defend themselves. I'm going to tell you, today there is a global depopulation agenda, and it starts by taking guns away from honest people. From people that want to defend their families, they want to make it so they can't protect them, they don't have swords or spears, they don't have guns, they're not able to protect the innocent. And listen, the end times are upon us. The end of the world is getting closer and closer, it's getting weirder and weirder, and the devil is controlling the government, and the government wants to take your guns. There are, there are innocent people being killed. And listen, this, the Second Amendment is not for hunting. The Second Amendment is to protect the individuals from a tyrannical government. The Second Amendment is to protect us, the people. And yet the government wants to try to pass laws and do things to make it difficult or even impossible or illegal in some states to defend your very own family. This is very wicked. Look, it's happened in other countries and crime didn't disappear. Now people get stabbed to death or now they just get killed with illegal guns and the innocent, the good God-fearing people can't protect their families. Look, America is victim to this, this global depopulation agenda that is trying to disarm the citizens. And we as Christians, it is our duty to carry a gun and protect our family. It is our duty to protect the innocent, to defend the defenseless. And look, you guys probably saw it in the news, another one of these drug head, you know, like mind controlled, psychopath reprobates goes in and kills a bunch of innocent people. Now look, it happened in a synagogue, and the Bible warns us about the synagogue of Satan, and we know that there's a Zionist conspiracy all over the world. You know, so Zionists are bad, that is evil, the Jewish religion of today is not the Jews of the Bible. But look, that's not anti-Semite, right? Zionism is a wicked devil's religion. But it still doesn't justify anybody killing the innocent, the unarmed. That is murder, and the Bible says, thou shalt not kill. So look, whoever did it, is guilty. They're probably a reprobate. They're probably on drugs. They're probably in mind controlled. And the news and the media and the politicians are going to use it to spin it to favor Zionism and to favor gun control. This is part of the secret society's agenda. And look, the Bible warns us that these things are going to happen in the end times. And what we read right here in 1 Samuel 13 is this loud warning about people not having weapons, not being able to defend themselves. And again, listen, we as Christians must carry a gun and defend our families and defend ourselves. You think about it, 11 people were killed in a synagogue. If one of them had a gun, they could have stopped it. They could have saved 10 lives if one person was carrying a gun to stop this murderer. Hey, carrying guns stops killers. Christians defending themselves by arming themselves can stop mass murderers. And this is a lesson we can learn right from the Bible. The Bible does not say that we should just roll over and take it and be abused and be shot and be killed. Listen, the Bible says we should stand up in the face of tyranny and protect the innocent. Look at the next verse here. Verse number 20. But all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his share and his coulter and his axe and his mattock. For they had a file for the mattocks and for the coulters, and for the forks, and for the axes, to sharpen the goads. Can you imagine that? Well, we got to get ready for the enemy. Get your tools. Get out your wrenches and sharpen them up. Get your, get your hammer. Put, try to put an edge on it. Can you imagine living in such an age where you don't have any type of a weapon? Notice it said there were no smiths found in the land. Hey, they might make gunsmithing illegal in America, and that would go against God's word. And that would go also against the Second Amendment of our Constitution. And look, my righteous authority to have a weapon in my house doesn't come from the Constitution. It comes from God. 
God commands us to protect our own. And the Second Amendment, they want to rule on that. They want to say it means something it doesn't mean. And they want to try to take away from the laws that were established. And, you know, I don't care what they're trying to do. We're going to defend our families. We're going to defend our church. We're going to protect the innocent. And God will bless that. In America, if they make guns illegal, God will curse America. And we will find ourselves with a tyrannical government ready to take your lives. You know, if they take the guns away, get ready. Get ready, people will die. The innocents will hurt. Look at verse 22 here. So it came to pass in the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan. But with Saul and with Jonathan, his son, there was found. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 21. Look, they at least had enough wisdom to have a weapon. The leaders had weapons. The poor people had nothing. Because of the Philistines, because of the enemies, because they were trying to prevent it. They passed laws and they said, you can't defend yourself from this tyrannical government. Well, as Christians, we know what happens throughout history when people are not able to protect themselves. And, and we are going to prepare, we're going to stand up. The helpless people are being mass murdered by, by these crazy reprobates, by children of the devil that have an agenda and the news wants to use it. Look, if, if one of you were in that synagogue today, you might have spared some lives. Hey, better than that, you might have spared a soul. Just the fact that they're in a synagogue tells you they're probably not saved. They're probably in hell right now. And maybe they didn't have a chance because of this person that wanted to kill the innocent. Maybe if you were there with a spiritual sword and there with a physical sword, you could have spared some lives and spared some souls. Look, as Christians, we have a duty to preach the gospel. We have a duty to stand up for the innocent, and you are responsible to protect your family. Look at 1 Samuel 21, where you're at. Find verse number 8. Verse number 8. And David said unto Elimelech, And is there not here under thine hand spear or sword? For I have neither bought my, brought my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's business required haste. And the priest said, The sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom thou slewest in the valley of Elah, behold, it is here, wrapped in a cloth, behind the ephod. If thou wilt take that, take it. For there is no other save that here. And David said, There is none like that, give it me. So they said, we've got one sword here, and it's the sword of Goliath. Now David killed Goliath. He used that sword to cut off his head after he killed him with the stone. So hey, that was David's sword rightfully anyway, right? That was his trophy for slaying the giant that was blaspheming the God of the Bible. So here, but notice the priest, they said that there was neither sword nor spear found. I'm sorry, back up. There, there is none other save that here, he says in verse 9. There is none other save that here. He says, hey, we've only got one sword in the whole place, and it's this one. What are they saying? The people were defenseless. Nobody was armed. Nobody was able to protect their own family. And history tells us that's bad news. That's when wicked people come up and they molest the innocent. Go to the next chapter. Go to chapter 22. Didn't they learn a lesson from what happened? Didn't they look in history and see, and say, hey, now we have a king. Now we're being liberated. We should begin to arm ourselves. No, they just thought they were at peace. It's okay. We've got one sword. We have a king. He'll protect us. Look in the next chapter what happened here. Verse 13. And Saul said unto him, Why have ye conspired against me, thou and the son of Jesse, and that thou hast given him bread and a sword, and hast inquired of God for him, that he should rise against me, to lie in wait, as it is this day. Then Elimelech answered the king and said, And who is so faithful among all thy servants as David, which is the king's son-in-law, and goeth at thy bidding, and is honorable in thy house? So he said, well, Why did you give David that sword, Goliath's sword? He said, Hey, I thought he's here doing your business. Hey, king, that's your servant. We were just helping your your." Uh, your service, they thought, they thought he's on your mission, we're just helping your guy, right? But obviously Saul had a bad spirit, he didn't see it that way. Look at verse number 17. And the king said unto the footman that stood by, Turn and slay the priests of the Lord, because their hand is also with David. And because they knew when he fled and did not show it to me. 
that the servants of the king would not put forth their hand to fall upon the priests of the Lord. So David's servants from Jerusalem, or I'm sorry, Saul's servants from Jerusalem, the men from Jerusalem that were serving the king, they're commanded by the king. Imagine the king says, kill, kill the priests, kill God's people. Yeah. And they said, whoa, I'm not killing them. Yeah. Now the priests at that moment, they had an opportunity to pull out their own sword, right? To defend themselves, to get a spear ready, to get a shield. But guess what? They had nothing. Where was their sword? Where was their opportunity to spare life? They acquiesced to the power of a tyrant. And they lost their lives. Look at the next verse here. Verse number 18. And the king said to Doeg, Turn thou and fall upon the priest. And Doeg the Edomite, and he fell upon the priest, he turned and fell upon the priest and slew on that day fourscore and five persons that did wear a linen ephod. He killed 85 priests. Don't you think one man with one sword that somebody could have stopped him? I mean, give me a chair. <laughs> give me something. Give me a cup. Give me a plate. Give me a glass. Give me a book. I'm going to try to protect myself. One man, one sword, 85 priests, dead. They were defenseless, they were not armed, and they lost their life because of it. Look at the next verse. And Nob, the city of the priests, smote he with the edge of the sword, both men and women, children and sucklings, and oxen and asses and sheep with the edge of the sword. Doeg the Edomite here, this reprobate, then he goes into the city and he kills the innocent people. He kills innocent children. Dads could not protect themselves or their children or their wives and many lives died this day at the hand of a reprobate look and Doag the Edomite did not fear God I want you to turn to Exodus chapter 22 go to Exodus chapter 22 all throughout history there have been wicked murderers of God's people and hey where were the swords where are the guns again this thing with 11 people getting shot if one person had one gun, they could have ended it all right there. Yeah. They could have stopped him dead in his tracks. They could have saved many lives. Right. Right. But however, they were all probably liberal. They probably didn't even own a gun. Their idea of defending their children is to put parental control on a TV and let them watch whatever they want, <laughs> right? The biblical defense is to own a weapon, protect your children, teach your children how to use weapons so they have a responsible attitude toward guns. So they don't have a foolish attitude toward guns. Hey, I believe in gun control. Hey, use both hands if you have to. I believe in gun control. Take it from the fool if you have to and defend yourself. Protect your family. Look, you're in Exodus 22. Look at verse number 2. If a thief be found breaking up, and be smitten that he die, there shall no blood be shed for him. Look, this is biblical justified defense. They're saying there's no bloodshed, that's not murder. Well, Brother Fan, if somebody breaks in my house tonight, do I have the right to execute them? If it's in defense, yes. If they're coming in, it's dark, you can't see what their intentions are, you can't see what they're doing, you drop them. You protect your family. That's your God-given responsibility. That's your duty. And hey, even the Constitution, even the state of Florida would back you up on that. Well, of course, they're breaking in. You have the right to do it. Now look, we are not to be murderers. Thou shalt not kill. Don't go looking for a fight. If you're one of these end-time conspiracy theorists, look, there's a reality to it. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm a conspiracy realist. I realize it's true. I realize what's coming. But you know what? I need to walk in the Spirit. If you are in the flesh, you say, oh, I can't wait for the day. I'm saving up ammo, and I'm going to get in my bunker, and I'm going to fight him. And I... No, 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 no. That's not godly. That's not the way. We're going to talk about the end times here in a second. But let's take this in context. Look at the next verse here. Self-defense is legit. Murder is still murder. Look at verse 3. If the sun be risen upon him, there shall be, there shall be blood shed for him, for he should make full restitution. If he have nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. If the theft be certainly found in his hand alive, whether it be ox or ass or sheep, he shall restore double. If somebody comes in your house and you can see them and they're not pointing a weapon at you, they don't have you in jeopardy for your life, you, you have the power to stop them without killing them. You should. 
You should not be looking for an opportunity to shoot somebody. Hey, I hope all of you carry guns, and hey, I hope none of you ever have to use them. I hope none of you ever have to pull it out, because look, when you pull it out, it's too late. You're crossing a line. You, I hope you never have to pull it out and never have to shoot somebody, and if there's an opportunity to spare the life, even of a robber, you should do it. Even of somebody breaking into your house. Hey, but if it's in the middle of the night, you can't see what's going on, your reaction is to defend your, your family, that's righteous. That's defense, and we're commanded to do it. Go to, go to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. So we see what happens in 1 Samuel 22 when those don't have a weapon, many people die. Exodus 22 tells us that if somebody breaks in, that you should kill them, and your blood will not be required of you because you're defending yourself. Let's see what the Lord Jesus Christ says in Luke chapter 22. Look at verse number 35. And when he said unto them, When I sent you without purse and script and shoes, lacked ye anything? And they said nothing. I feel, I feel like that about coming to Jacksonville. When this door opened up and I came here, I lacked nothing. God provided everything all the way. And look, but look what Jesus is saying here. There's something happening in his ministry. There's a transition. He was no longer going to be with them. And he begins to warn them of the times to come. Look at verse 36. Luke 22, 36. Then said he unto them, But now he that hath a purse, let him take it. And likewise his scrip. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. He's saying, make it a priority to be able to defend your family. Amen. Jesus was very clear about this. He was making it very important. Hey, I don't think they ever needed a sword the whole time they're with the Lord. And, and we're going to see even when they used it, it wasn't right. Look at, the, look at verse 37. For I say unto you that this is written and must be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors for the thing concerning me have an end. He's saying, I'm going away. My ministry is going away. I must die. I must resurrect. These things have to happen. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, it is enough. That's good. You said, hey, I got a shotgun and I got a pistol. That's enough. Right? You don't need a machine gun. You don't need 14 pistols. You can't shoot, but what, two at a time, all right? Like, don't be a gun nut, but you need to be serious about being able to protect your family. And you need to be serious about training your family in how to defend themselves and protect themselves. There are wicked people out here. There are molesters that walk up and down this street every day looking for a victim, looking for a crime, looking for an opportunity. And we're going to defend our children. We're going to defend our families. We're going to defend those that can't defend themselves. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 2. Now keep your finger here. We're coming right back to this passage. Acts chapter 8. Keeping your finger in Luke 22. Look, we need to get ready for hard times. We need to get ready to defend families. Jesus was showing this transition here. In Proverbs 21 it says, The horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. Look, if somebody wants to put a gun in your face, safety is of the Lord. I've, I've had guns pulled on me more than once, out soul winning, even before, even just in life, out playing basketball one night as a teenager, I said I put a gun in my chest. I've had it happen more than one time, and you know what? Safety is of the Lord. My confidence was not in being able to wrestle it from him or talk my way out of it. My confidence was, well, I'm praying, Lord, help me. And he did, and he answered my prayer. And look, people use this verse to try to say you should not defend yourself or arm yourself. But you notice the first half of the verse. It says, the horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. Is your horse prepared? Is your house secured? Is your gun loaded? Are you ready? Do you have a way to defend your family if somebody comes breaking up in the middle of your house in the middle of night? Because you ought to. You ought to be able to protect the innocent. Look, you're in Acts chapter 8. Look at verse number 1. So why, what was Jesus warning about? We see it right here in Acts chapter 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death. That was Stephen. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. 
and devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made a great lamentation. So Paul was consenting. Saul let it happen. He was taking part in killing this guy. Look at verse 3. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore, that they were scattered abroad, went everywhere preaching the word. Go to the next chapter. Listen, Saul was not working for the government. Saul was acting on his own authority. He was working under the authority of the religious Jews, which were not God's chosen people. It is a fake religion, and they're looking for a fake political antichrist today. And he's warning, hey, here's the government. The Romans were in charge, and yet Saul was breaking into people's houses, carrying them away, hurting people. Saul was breaking the law. Saul was guilty of murder, even under the Romans' law, but he was getting away with it. Look at chapter 9. Look, is your horse prepared for the day of battle? Do you have a sword? Have you bought a sword as Jesus said? Hey, he said, buy a gun. Look at verse number 1. Acts 9, verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Again, you understand what's happening here? Saul, under religious authority, was leaving one political district and going into another political district with permission to bind up a man or a woman and drag them back to Jerusalem so they can persecute them all the more. Could you imagine if your wife is praying at church and you find out that some Jew from some synagogue came into the church and drug her out and took her to another state or another country to try to lock her up and put her in prison? Well, wouldn't you be a little mad? But that's what Saul was requesting. He said, I'm going to go get him. I'm going to do this. He was doing it outside of the law. And these families should have been protecting themselves. They had an opportunity to end it. Obviously, God stepped in. We're going to see that here. You know, that he was not the Roman authority. Look at verse 3. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Jesus took it personally. Saul says, I'm going to go get those Christian women and lock them up. Jesus said, you're persecuting me. Jesus said, that's me. That's my bride. That's my church. That's my people. You're persecuting me. But then Jesus revealing this to him says, why are you kicking against the pricks? He thinks he's working for God, but he's going against God. Look, this was a, this was a reprobate moment, I believe, with Saul. Look, salvation is walking through the door. One of y'all said it in your men's preaching night. It's not a hallway. It's not a lifestyle of change. Oh, you should change your thoughts in your life. No, no, no. Salvation is a one-time thing. It's what you believe in your heart. Once you're saved, you're always saved, even if your lifestyle doesn't change. Hey, thank God, we're all still sinners. He, his grace is sufficient for me. But here, Paul, called out by God, why are you kicking against the pricks? This is a moment where God's saying, listen, you're going against me. Now, Saul had a choice there. Either to say, I'm still going to go against you, and I believe he would have become a reprobate. Or he, instead, he said, okay, what do I have to do to be saved? Look at the next verse. Verse 6. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Go back to Luke chapter 22. And again, God didn't save Paul here. Paul had to hear the gospel preached by a Christian. And that Christian had reservations. Wait, this guy, he's a murderer. He's killing us. Are you sure? God? Look, hey, but they did it. He was bold enough in this fear that, hey, you know what? I'm going to do what God said. God has my back. The horse is prepared against the day of battle, but, but safety is of the Lord. And that was the right attitude. So they got Paul saved because he heard words of salvation and he believed it. That was his reprobate moment, right? The first reprobate in the Bible was Cain. It said that the Lord had respect unto Abel's offering, right? But unto Cain's offering, he had not respect. Why? Because Cain brought of his own works, 
right? The Bible says that he slew his brother because he was of that wicked one. God came to him and had that same reprobate moment. You know, he said, why kickest thou against the pricks, right? What did he say? He said, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? Sin lieth at the door. People have a moment in their life where it's like, if you've rejected, you've rejected. There's that reprobate door. Will you walk through it? If you do, there's no going back. Once you're damned, you're always damned. Just as much when somebody is unsaved and they hear the gospel, it's their opportunity to walk through the door of salvation. Eternally secure, forever. Regardless of the state of their flesh, it's what's in their spirit. You're back in Luke 22. And look, I, I bring this up because reprobates are murderers. Paul almost became a reprobate. Cain did become a reprobate. What did he do? Killed his innocent brother. From the very beginning of the blood of righteous Abel, there has been a persecution on Christians, on God's people. And it's only going to get worse as the end gets closer and closer. So in the meantime, we need to protect ourselves. And so here we are in Luke 22. I want you to find verse 47. This is after Jesus said, buy a sword, sell your car, and go buy a gun, right? Look what he says, verse 47. And while he yet spake, behold, a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? When they which were about him saw what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? Now notice he didn't say yes. Look, trigger happy, gun nut Christians, walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Oh boy, Peter was eager for that fight. Oh yeah, I'll get him. Lord, I'll get him. Hey, why don't we call fire down from heaven? Right? He said, you don't know what spirit you're of. Right? We as Christians need to look to spare life, even of your enemy even of your own enemy, but when it crosses the line and it's time to defend your family, don't look back, don't hesitate, pull the trigger, protect the innocent. That's your godly duty. That's the attitude we ought to have. We ought to be in the spirit. Jesus didn't say, yeah, I get him, right? But he acted anyway of his own spirit, of his own attitude. Verse 50. And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. And he touched his ear and healed him. What's Jesus saying to his disciples? Suffer, hold on. Allow this to happen up to this point. Look, they're not killing me. Things must happen. Jesus is saying, allow them to take me alive. This must happen. Right? Jesus had... He understood the bigger vision. And look, the Bible says there's a time for peace and a time for war. Hey, there is a time to turn the other cheek. There is a time to turn. If somebody smacks you in the face, don't pull out your gun and shoot them. Turn the other cheek if you can. If you can walk away from that fight, do it and spare their life being the bigger man. Right? Peter didn't quite get that yet. Peter was zealous. He thought what Jesus was saying a few verses back was, was for the immediate. But there's a future context here. Go back one chapter to Luke chapter 28. Luke chapter 28. Look, in the end of the world, the end times here, we as Christians will be persecuted. Things will happen to us, and we need to be prepared spiritually. We've got to have our spiritual sword on us, in us, right? And you've got to have your physical sword sometimes as well. And when your family's in danger, when the innocent, when somebody, if somebody, if you're in a, in a gas station or a grocery store and somebody comes in and tries to hurt the innocent, do your best to protect the innocent and take down that murderer. Look at Luke 21, look at verse number eight. Verse number eight, and he said, take heed that ye be not deceived for many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ. And the time draweth near Go ye not therefore after them. But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. He's saying in the end times we're going to hear of global wars, we're going to hear of all these things happening. He said, don't be afraid, it's not yet. It's not at your doorstep yet. Don't get all afraid, don't bug out, don't head for the hills. Look what he says. Verse 10. Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, and famines, 
and pestilences and fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. God's saying, now you're going to start seeing some supernatural stuff. You'll see earthquakes. You'll see wars and rumors of wars. What he's talking about is the beginning of the time of tribulation. What we see in Revelation chapter 6. Look at verse 12. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. Well, it sounds a lot like what Saul was doing, but the Lord stopped him. Now, they could have prevented it. Obviously, there's supernatural elements there that didn't happen. Acts was not the fulfillment of this. Look at verse 13. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. God wants you to be spiritually ready, spiritually wise enough to react the right way at the right time. Look at verse 14. Settle it, therefore, in your hearts, not to meditate before what ye shall answer. He's saying, don't sit up late at night thinking, boy, if they come for me, I know what I'll say. Boy, if they put me on trial and I'm talking to the, those Zionist Jews, those, those fakes, they're not Semites. Look, they're wannabes. They're, they're not even of that bloodline. They're not of Abraham. They're not of the religion of God. They're not God's chosen people. And yet they will call us up before councils and synagogues to cast us in prison. And it may come to you to have a verse for them, to have an answer for them, to preach the gospel and warn them of the judgment to come. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's the end of your life. Listen, Christians will make it through the time of tribulation. Christians will make it through the Antichrist and the mark of the beast before the Lord returns. Settle it. It says, it shall turn to you for a testimony. Verse 15. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. They won't have a comeback. They won't have one good thing to say when the Holy Spirit works through you and rebukes them. And look at verse 16. And ye shall be betrayed both of parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends, and some of you shall they cause to be put to death. Yes, some of you may die. Some of you may have to lay your life down. But, verse 18, there shall not an hair of your head perish. In your patience possess ye your souls. I want you all to remember this verse. In your patience possess ye your souls. What is this saying? Look, in hard times, just be patient. Trust the Lord. Have confidence in Him. Maintain your composure. Hold your words. Let God speak through you. Don't react in fear. Don't react in the flesh. Hey, there's, there are some times when maybe the Antichrist comes to get you when, when you can't fight him with fists. You can't fight him with guns. All you can do is just go. And God's going to use you to testify against them and it will be held against them for eternity. And you will be rewarded in God's army. Look at verse 20. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. What's the big end time sign? That there will be wars, rumors of wars, pestilence, earthquakes in diverse places, right? Persecution of Christians specifically. Then he gets all, hey, then Jerusalem with armies, the abomination of desolation. Look at verse 21. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. And let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Turn to John chapter 18. John chapter 18. The days of vengeance are coming, a time of tribulation is coming. We may or may not see it in our life, but look, right now, we need to be spiritually prepared to defend our family. We need to be physically prepared to stop somebody from hurting the innocent. And look, this has happened several times in other states where Colorado, Texas, where uh, somebody comes in to shoot up a church and he gets stopped at the door. He dies without hurting anybody. And that's God's blessing. But when he goes into some Southern Baptist fake church 
right? Or some Methodist or, or some synagogue of Satan and people kill the innocent. God's not going to stop that. God's not protecting that. Look, safety is of the Lord. God will protect us. But in the meantime, we need to be ready to go out and protect others as well. If you find yourself in a public situation where you have an opportunity to stop a murderer, that's not murder, that's not killing, that's defense. And God blesses those that protects the innocent. You're in John chapter 18, find verse 33. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? He answered him, Sayest this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Listen to what he says here. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. He's talking about spiritual things. His kingdom is in your heart right now. Your soul is sealed into the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit of promise is living inside of you, that spirit of truth. It's not this flesh. Don't fight to preserve the flesh when you don't have to. Look what Jesus said. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Jesus is referring to the resurrection. Hey, there's going to come a day when we will be kings and priests. We will rule and reign with him. We will be in that spiritual army and God may send us to deliver judgment and execute the law on his behalf. Today is not that day. Today we have an unrighteous government. We have a bunch of perverts in Hollywood and in TV and in the music and they're trying to defile the minds of your children. And you need to use your spiritual sword to defend their heart. You need to use the Word of God and take a stand and say, no Hollywood in my house, no Disney in my house, they're a bunch of pedophiles, I won't let them in. Take a stand, be a man, stand up for what's right. Look at verse 37. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Go to Revelation chapter 6. We're almost done here. So Jesus says, hey, this is the reason I came into the world. This is why I was born. Yes, to be a king, but first I have to conquer death and hell. Then I will come back and I will conquer the Antichrist kingdom. We will defeat the devil. We will set the captives free. So salvation was his priority now. Spiritual warfare was his priority at the time. It was not in the flesh. And at the same time, there is a time for a Christian hey, to, to put up their defense, and there is a time not to. There is a time to pull out your gun, and there is a time not to. And you have to be walking in the Spirit. You have to learn the Word of God to know when the right time is. You have to be led by that Spirit of truth. And in the end of the world, we will have persecution. Jesus also warned in Luke 11, He says, When a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. You have a sword at home, you don't have to worry about somebody breaking in at night. But when a stronger than he has come, he shall come upon him and overcome him. He taketh from him all his armor, wherein he trusteth, and divideth his spoils. If somebody comes in and they got bigger guns or more guns, then they can do whatever they want. It's just common sense, but Jesus is reminding them, we need to be strong, we need to be prepared. In Matthew 10, Jesus said, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. I've had guns pointed at me, square in my chest, put up in my face at different times. I was not afraid of the man, I'm afraid of God. I should be walking in God's will. There came a split second decision, well is this it? Well if it is, I know where I'm going. If it is, I know where I'm going, that's okay. He says, but rather fear him, which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Those 11 people that got killed, they are probably in hell. There is a good possibility because they were in the synagogue of Satan. They were not saved. They were not trusting on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. And now they're in hell. Their body and their, their soul has been destroyed. Meanwhile, we as Christians, we've been given the task. Let's save some souls. Let's preach the gospel of peace to everyone. 
anyone that wants to hear, we're going to give it to them. Well, that's our goal. That's our purpose in this church. Meantime, we will protect the body as well. Amen. Revelation chapter 6, look at verse number 1. And I saw when the Lamb had opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts, saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. This is the beginning of the time of tribulation. This is the Antichrist coming in on the white horse. And what's he doing? Is he bringing in peace? No. He's bringing in war. Conquering and to conquer. Wars and rumors of wars. He's coming in in the spirit of war. And we need to be ready. Hey, where is your sword? If war breaks out in America tomorrow, if there's martial law in the streets, and you can no longer buy a sword, I hope you got one now. I hope you're ready to protect your family now. Because look, if a bunch of thugs try to break in your house for food, you better protect the lives of your children and your wife. Men, that's your responsibility. That's not the Antichrist. That's not the end times. That's not you called up before a synagogue for a witness. There is a time to defend. There is a time to stand and be ready. And hey, look, in the end times, things are going to get weird. Look at verse number 8. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. A fourth of the earth will die in the tribulation. We will see this happen. Death and hell following. You're going to see thousands upon millions of people dying in other countries, and maybe even this country, and going to hell right away. And we need to defend against this attack if it comes to your doorstep. Look at verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. This is the persecution on Christians for their Christianity because they would not take the mark of the beast because they would not worship the Antichrist they're put to death they're beheaded they're attacked they're shot they're killed and God says this is the fifth seal this is the worst time on earth there's never been anything like it before that I believe you're righteous to defend yourself hey even at that moment there's a time still to defend yourself and again you have to be walking in the spirit look at verse 10 and they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not, not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants and also their brethren that they should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. God is telling us there's a time. It's going to happen. It will be fulfilled. Go to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. And it may come to you for a testimony to lay down your life instead of receiving the mark of the beast. Look, if you're surrounded, they got you, and they say, here, all you have to do is take this mark and we'll let you go. Don't take the mark. I don't think you even can take the mark. I think it's a trick. I think it's a deception. When you take the mark of the beast, you're worshiping the image of the beast. You're worshiping the dragon. If you want to worship the devil and take a mark in your hand so you can buy food, if you think you can trick the devil, you're not. He knows. He's going to kill you anyway. You might as well have some spine and stand up for what's right. Are you saying we have to be martyrs? It may be. Look, this may not happen in our generation. This may not even happen in our children's generation. But yet you need to be spiritually prepared now to lay down your life rather than worship the devil to lay down your life instead of follow the world. And you also need to prepare to protect your house. Look at Revelation chapter 12. Find verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth 
that he hath but a short time. This is teaching us there will be three and a half years of the devil's wrath. The Lord will return. We will be resurrected. And then there will be three and a half years of God's wrath poured out on the earth. Look, a Christian will be with God during that time. God's not going to appoint, uh, we're not appointed unto wrath, right? But how about the verses before that say we are appointed unto affliction and tribulation. The Bible is clear. The man of sin, the son of perdition, will reveal himself. He'll proclaim to be God. They're going to have a, a temple, whether it be the right temple or the wrong temple or the right place or the wrong place. It doesn't really matter. The Antichrist will set up a temple, say it's God's temple, and then stand in there and say, I am God. This is my temple. Worship me. And when we see that, we'll know, oh boy, here it comes. They're coming after us next. Get ready. And these principles have been here for thousands of years, and we need to warn our children. We need to be prepared spiritually for the time of the devil's wrath. Look at verse 17 in this chapter, Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Who is the seed? Hey, we're the seed. We're God's chosen people because we have the testimony of Jesus Christ. We are commanded to obey the gospel. This isn't saying, oh, you got to keep the Sabbath, or oh, you got to, no, 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 look, why? I don't keep the Sabbath to be saved, I don't get baptized to be saved, I don't repent of my sins to be saved, I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the testimony of Jesus. And those that do not have that, they will not have any problem changing their gospel, changing their heart, changing their religion, and saying, oh, well, look, the Hebrew Roots Movement, they taught us that we were wrong all along. There's this new Jesus. He's a political leader. Oh, we missed it. The Messiah is a political savior. All we have to do is worship him, take his mark, put that chip in there, take that Google chip, we'll have internet on our eyeballs, right? Look out, the technology's coming. It's going to get, it'll be health, the healthcare chip. You won't ever get sick again. All you have to do is put this hexagram in your forehead and say this guy is God and he'll keep you healthy, right? That's Obamacare for you, right? <laughs> Look, go to Revelation 14 and we'll be done. Revelation chapter 14. Look at verse number 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Remember in Luke what he say? In your patience possess you your souls. Look at this. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus... And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Listen, Christian, when you pass on, your works will follow you. You will be rewarded by God. He will give you a position in eternity based on what you do on this earth. And look, if you're eager for a fight, you're not being very spiritual. But at the same time, if you're not willing to defend your family, you're not being very spiritual either. If you're not willing to stop a mass murderer by arming yourself, you're not being very Christian-like. Jesus told his disciples to carry a sword. If you don't have one, sell your jacket, sell your extra car, sell your computer, sell your Xbox, do whatever you have to do to be ready to protect the innocent. Meanwhile, he reminds us though, right, in your patience possess your souls. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they which keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. We need to go out preaching the gospel. Go to Revelation 16. This will be the last verse. Revelation chapter 16. There is a wrath coming upon the earth from the devil. It's probably closer than we think. But again, it may not be in my lifetime. It, it can't happen at any moment. You know, these false Zionists, these pre-tribbers, this anti-Christ religion that, that falls right in line with the Mormons and the Seventh-day Adventists and the Jehovah's Witness that are looking for an earthly Zion, that's a lie. That's deception. The Hebrew roots, Hebrew was restored in 1881 by a bunch of rabbis who said, hey, let's just talk Hebrew together. Look, Hebrew is a dead language. You know, if you're saying the name of Jesus in Hebrew, you're doing it wrong. If you're English, say his name. It's Jesus. Yeah. Revelation 16, 6. Look at this. For they have shed the blood of the saints and the prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are 
worthy. Those that persecute you will find God's wrath upon them. And God says, you are worthy of my wrath because you hated me and my people. Look, it's been that way since the beginning. It will be that way until the end. Things will only get weirder and weirder. And it is your Christian duty to arm yourself, protect your family, and defend the innocent. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for the instruction that you give us about all things in life. Lord, I pray that these 11 souls that, Lord, it's too late for them, but I pray that these 11 souls that are lost, it might be motivation for others to go out and preach the gospel and let it be known that you died for the sins of the world. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the free gift of salvation. Lord, I pray that you would keep us safe. Our safety is of you and you alone. And Lord, in the meantime, we will prepare our horse